to us if we are planning a garden sometimes we draw it out yeah we have the pathway yeah so we have uh, plants to be put there so we have a gazebo If we are walking along this pathway, why we walk along this pathway? Because the designer already put the stepping stones here, already planned on the design. So when we come in, oh, that is the entrance, we come in from there, and we walk this way, yeah, we walk to here, we want to go to the back, suddenly it rains, we will run back here, or if it's too hot, we're tired, we want to rest, we go to the, there's a rest hut there, all right there is actually communication between the person who draw the plan who designed this with the people because when we came in we don't have to stand there oh please walk this way no it's already laid out for you he if he was the one who designed he's communicating with you without speaking to you Unspoken words. You are tired, you can have a rest there. Dr. Rupi, if you want to do your work, you can do it there. Here we're going to have our course here because the tables are already arranged. The chairs are already here. He didn't tell you, Gary, you sit here, Edwin, you sit here. No. You already know. Okay? You want to smoke cigarette, you go away that sign, don't. <laughs> 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 By the same token, I can talk to the beast without spoken words. Yeah? So I'm the bee whisperer, the stingless bee whisperer. You know why? Because you can use the plants okay, to partition the resources. Right? Okay. These bees are small bees to tiny bees. Okay? Now you have resources up there, okay? You think these bees will fly up to the coconuts or the canopy of those trees up there? They're not going to fly up there. The moment they go up, winds have eddy currents, what we call eddy currents, mm -hmm. okay? When a wind blows, it goes. And these wings are so tiny that they you seen how they fly, you know? Unlike the bigger bees, they can fly well, they can land. Now these tiny bees, they can't even land on a flower properly. They'll land at the petal and crawl in. Okay? So, what's going to happen is, if you are planting the wrong flowers, that flowers at the wrong levels, the bees will not get the optimum. They will get, they will survive, okay? You will get your honey, but your one kilo of honey, is it 100% productivity or is it 80% or is it 50%? Maybe you're only getting 30%. If you follow the right partitioning, you might even get three kilos. Like somebody who's always boasting in the uh, Facebook, he gets three kilos in Alaminos. <laughs> but I went there. We did see it. You know? He did get three kilos. It's fantastic. But once a year. The three kilos he only gets once a year. So I'm telling him, if you apply biscuit, you may be able to get three kilos twice a year. Oh, Amihana Bigat, you know that. Fine. You got your weather. I also got my weathers. I have monsoon into monsoon, monsoon into monsoon. Huh? But we can still do it. And we harvest three times a year. We harvest by quarterly. Quarterly means every three months. January, February, March, we harvest. April, May, June, we harvest. July, August, September, we harvest. October, November, December, we don't harvest because that is the heavy monsoon. Because if we harvest, then the bees got nothing to drink. Okay? So, you can do the same thing. It's a matter of working it out. Alright? And I went to Sosogon. They harvest twice a year. They split once a month. 
Yes. Eh, sorry, once a year. <laughs> <laughs> that was just testing you. See, see whether you're awake or not. Uh, it was just testing you. Once a year, they can split. And they really can split because when they open up, my God, it was like 15,000 bees. You know? And 50,000, you divide by two, you get 7575. That is a normal colony. Alright? Okay. So. From, from coconut. Yeah, the bao. Bao cake. Uh, not bad, huh, my pronunciation. Yeah. Getting better every time we call you. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, where do we go from there? We know now that we can speak to the bees. Yeah? Okay. So. If there's a lot of predators over there, like maybe, you know, there's some birds, insectivorous birds, or those... Uh, there's some groups who are keeping those uh, bird nests. Swallows, is it? Swiftlets, eh? mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Uh, if there's a swiftlets house there, okay, you don't want the bees to go there. What do you do? So you plant trees or bananas like that, Right, we have banana flowers, or you plant those creepers going up, you no, know, as a fence. So what's going to happen is the bees going to fly, and they're going to go on this side of the fence because it's flower on this side. So the dangers over there, they will not go across. You make sure all the planting flowers are all over here, right? And they are small bees, so they want to fly and forage down below. Go for the ground covers, the low shrubs, right? So it's just like you telling them, hey, don't go so far. It's, it's all here, you know? Something like that. So this is where resource partitioning comes in. Now, resource partitioning, not only among different species of bees, but different species of insects, okay? The bigger hornets, the... If you have dosata or the bigger ones, millifera even, they're going to forage up there. You don't see uh, wasp or what do you call this? Uh, yeah, the bigger, the bigger bees, they really come down. They are mostly on the eye level uh, flowers. It's only the ground covers are foraged by the stingless bees, lower ones, okay? So if you're keeping stingless bees, you want to provide food for them, give them the low flowers, the ground covers, okay? Which Lee Gaitana tried to do. He did try to do. I know because the last time I came here, we talked about it. And you, what, you know what happened? All the gangsa sapu all the ground cover. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, you got to decide, you want gangsa or you want stingless bees? <laughs> you can't have the best of both worlds. Or, you cordon off your gangsa. Right? Then you have, this is for your stingless bees. So that way, when you partition off for the gangsa, you're also talking to the gangsa. Hey, you don't come over this side, you're only that side. Right? So, this is how... Dr. Doolittle or King Solomon spoke to the animals, right? You're thinking, oh, he can speak the elephant language or... No, it's just understanding the animal that you want to breed, that you want to keep, okay? Understanding their foraging habits and you apply it, you manipulate. Someone was asking how to manipulate, yeah? Okay, so that is part of biscuit. That's how you manipulate them, right? You're not cheating them, you're still providing them. <laughs> okay, so uh, this research partitioning, what I want to draw here is... <coughs> ah, let me try. Okay, let's say you got some palms, right? Okay, these are some palms, it can be betel nut palm, it can be cocoa palms, and you got some trees here.
like uh, what I saw in Kaburihan, you know, and it wasn't really planned kind of escape. I was there visiting Joe and uh, just walking along the village, uh, the Santa Fe village. There's a big bed of camote, and the camote were flowering. Okay, bees were happy there, and then there were levels of. Uh, I said, Mimosa Purika is what? Makahia. Yeah, what? Makahia. Yeah. Yeah. Makahia. Yeah. Makahia. Now, as a garden, you don't want to plant Makahia. But you can do a nice bed with all Makahia, with nice purple flowers, you know. It can be beautiful. Then you got this Asistasia. Asistasia has got the highest bricks value for any weed. Asistasia. If you can Google it, it's got the sweetest nectar for for a week. Asistasia intrusa. Okay, then you can go for potulaka. Potulaka, you know? Yes. All right. Uh, mimosa. Asistasia. <laughs> Uh, you know those peanut flowers? Yes. Yeah, Arakis. Arakis hypogia. Arakis pintoi. Peanut flowers. Um, I don't know, I can't, I can't think of uh, many, but uh, of course you can buy my biscuit book and everything is there. Um, okay, so that is for ground covers, okay? So you can have those beds here, you have ground covers here. Then you can have annuals. A bed of annuals, like uh, Celosia, Zinnia. Um, this one is also good, it's a bromeliad that uh, will flower. The flower racemes are very nice. Uh, Bromidiates are the pineapple family. Yes, uh, I've seen stingless bees. Uh, they go but it's a charity. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, because uh, I, I told them the last time, you know, so they go. <laughs> tilansia, tilansia, air plants. You're talking about air plants. Yeah, but they want very hard to flower and it, it's expensive, uh, yeah. right? Oh, okay. So bromelia is like those on the tree, he stuck that on the tree. Those, when they flower, it's beautiful. Petunias. All these Petunias. limes and uh, calamansi, Petunias. citrus, you know. The, you don't have to let it grow so tall, but when they are about this high, the calamansi, you know, flowers profusely, yeah? Okay, so basically, you know, you can have shrubs or even uh, banana plants, heliconias, okay? Right. So basically what I'm trying to explain is this at the canopy, we call this Joe, level one, Joe? Huh? How many levels we have? Ah, okay, so Joe, continue. Continue, level four. Level, level one. Level okay, two. man, level one. All right, Joe has uh, some. <laughs> okay, so level one will be the canopy and the coconuts. Okay, the palms are great. You know why? Because the palms, the palm flowers are downwards, and birds do not fly under the canopy of the palms. They don't fly under, them. so that your bees are safe under the palms. All right. And this one, you want to avoid things which are flowering up, try to find those that are flowering downwards, okay? So this is level one, okay? Then you have, what level, Joe? Level two. Two. Okay, level two are the bananas, you know, uh, structural shrubs, like those limes, even papayas. The male papayas are favorite among the bees. The female papayas, not so much, okay? So that's level two. Then you have this one, which is level three. Level three, okay? 
all the shrubs which are at this level. Okay. Even this, this is uh, balsam, balsam plant. Uh, purple one is this mundia, and then you have those uh, iris, some lilies there. Lilies also can. Cosmos will be here, okay, level three. Those are the cosmos are annuals also, right? Then you have your ground cover, which is level four. Okay. Why I break up into levels is when you design a garden, okay? You know, plant this, plant that, plant this, plant that. But the design is only from the top, you draw it out, it is two dimension. Okay? Why I give you levels is that so that the perception of three dimension comes into mind. Okay? So you must not only design according to what's on the ground, but the levels. Okay? So that's the essence of the escape. Now, the other thing also is because it helps you guide the bees to go towards the better plants or to avoid predators. Okay? So if you know that if it's too open, birds will come in, or if you put plants like the cherry plant, botinia, these are plants which birds like to perch, you know, because they like to eat the cherries. But some birds are carnivorous or insectivorous. They eat both berries, cherries, and insects. Okay? So you want to avoid these predators. And then you want to avoid also, um, you can have aquatic plants, all right? But you must realize that the ecology, you are now, when you say manipulate, you are actually manipulating the ecology. Right? In normal vegetation, in normal uh, conditions, okay, you don't get this many hives. In 10 hectares, there's only probably 30 hives in the wild. Okay? But here, you're putting 30 hives in less than an acre. Okay. So what's happening is the ecology becomes unbalanced. When you put in bees, when there was normally no bees, the bees are attracting what? Predators. They attract frogs and lizards. Okay? Now frogs and lizards attract what? Snake. So you see, the, the chain is such, you, you cannot avoid that. So now you're going to start thinking of how am I going to keep the snakes away? Visitors are coming, my children are here, you know? So, <laughs> so you got to look for ways of how, you know, to go to the next rung in the food chain, okay? What eats snakes? Okay? So you also will have problems with insectivorous birds. What eat snakes, birds, frogs, and lizards? What? Owls. So we over there, we keep owls. See? Because you try to go to the market, can I have a can of spray of anti-snake? No such thing. Right? How can you keep owls? You can. Who said you can? We do. How? It's endangered. Is it endangered? No cage. No. It's not caged. It's not caged. Let me see. How could you? Okay, you can't if you don't have owls, okay? Uh, keep feral cats. I, I have a problem with bee eaters. How, how can I. You have a problem with? Uh, bee eaters. We all have. Yeah, okay. So for bee eaters, we put up. Uh, bird nets, 
nets. Hmm? Bird nets. Bird nets. Nets. Yes. Yeah, put it up. I shut down 25 for the last uh, three weeks or so. Because you're such a killer. Why are you Oh! That's your profile you, picture in your WhatsApp. How do you domesticate? Oh, now I know nice. how Harry Potter looks like. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, this is the this is the cure I use for snakes and frogs and lizards. Yeah. And okay, this one was uh, it was caught in the wild as a baby. It's uh, when I was playing with it. It's one and a half years old. Okay. So in uh, our paddy fields, right? We have the same problem of mice and snakes and whatnot. So they built tall houses. It's about this size, okay, with the roof and just an empty hole, and you just put it there, all right? So, okay. Sooner or later, um, the owls come over and uh, build a family there. He'll find uh, some pretty bird and, you know, <laughs> have, have kids there and they take care of the paddy fields. Yeah. So it's common in Sulawesi, in Borneo, in Peninsula, Malaysia, in Sumatra. Yeah. Right? So it's something that uh, you can look into. All right? Now, besides owls, keep cats that do not eat all this frisky and uh, you know, cats that can really catch mice and catch frogs and you know, birds. Okay, so I'm told to make a break. Uh,